Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. So if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Um, do you have any high school students in the room? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. My people, my people, I love it. And high school leaders, what's up? What's up, man? Uh, I love my high schoolers. And they, when they heard me turn to Mark, they probably started freaking out because they thought I was going to preach the same thing I preached two weeks ago. Uh, because right now on Wednesday nights, we are going through the gospel of Mark. Uh, we started in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and we're just going to walk our way through it, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we just started to get into Mark chapter 2. But a couple of weeks ago, I was just reading through the whole gospel. I wanted to read through it in one sitting before I really started unpacking sermon after sermon. And um, when I got to Mark chapter 6, it was one of those stories that I've, I've known my whole life. I remember VBS hearing it, Vacation Bible School, Children's Church, growing up hearing it here. Uh, one of those events that I've known my entire life, and the Lord just used it in a fresh new way to bless me um, in just an incredible way. So I'm excited this morning because I feel like this morning I just get to re-pour out everything the Lord poured into me, and um, I'm excited for that. So if you have Mark chapter 6, would you turn uh, to there, and would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word? And I'd encourage you, if you're home, watching at home, would you stand up too, because uh, you're with us. You're not just watching a, a show online. You're worshiping with us. So, uh, But I want to do something real quick. Um, I want to juke you out for just a second. I watched a lot of college football yesterday. My Tar Heels won. And, uh, and yes, sir, go Heels. And uh, I want to give you a little juke real quick. We're going to get to Mark chapter 6, okay? We're going to get there. I know I told you to turn there. But together, I just want to read over us Psalm 23 this morning, okay? So we're going to get to Mark 6, so you can keep your Bible there. But for us, I want to read over us Psalm 23. This is what the Lord says. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want... He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Have you, uh, have you been enjoying Preacher's Series through Psalm 23? Uh, I really have been too, and uh, I'm not trying to preach Psalm 23 today because he can do that far better than I can, and I can't wait for him to do that next week. Um, but I would like to add today uh, maybe a bonus message to his series, maybe uh, just like a bonus addition. Um, and I didn't ask him, so I hope he's okay with it. Uh, but I want to look at Mark chapter 6, because what I believe is happening in Mark chapter 6 is we see the good shepherd in action. We see the good shepherd of Psalm 23 in action. Would you pray with me? And then we'll dive in. Lord, we love you. And uh, Lord, I just thank you so much this morning how we've already worshipped you in such a profound way. And um, Lord, I thank you so much for the music. I thank you for the opportunity to lift up our voice to you. But Lord, our worship does not stop just because the music stopped playing. Lord, we are continuing to worship you now in the way that we study and read your word. And so, uh, when we just confess together that we believe it's true, that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but your word endures forever. So your word has something to say to us today. And what I pray that you would just help me not necessarily say anything new, just communicate what your word has to say to us. And um, I pray that you would help me do that this morning. I pray for every room, person in this room, for every person watching um, at home, would I just pray for them, would I pray, Holy Spirit, you would move in a powerful way and draw us close to yourself today. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. So Mark chapter 6, we're going to start in about verse 30. And we, we need to understand that when we're jumping into Mark chapter 6, verse 30, we're coming into a pretty uh, big moment for the disciples. The disciples have just come out of a pretty big test. Um, do, do you remember maybe at your first ever job or the job that you're at now? Do you remember your first week when you go through the training process? Right? You get on the job and you have a manager or someone higher than you that's training you on how to do what you've just been hired to do. And they're showing you how to do it. They're standing over your shoulder, maybe helping you alongside. Uh, but it's a pretty intense moment, isn't it? When after a while, the boss says, okay, uh, I got to go do this project. You work on this project by yourself. Right? You remember that first moment when the job you're paid to do, you actually have to do it on your own. 
It's a pretty intense thing because then your manager's going pack, gonna come back and judge the work that you did, okay? And now imagine that your boss is Jesus. <laughs> imagine that Jesus, because he can see it all, right? He's omniscient, he's all-knowing. And so uh, it doesn't even matter the finished product, he can see how you're doing it along the way too. Imagine that that was happening for you and he was your boss. Well, that's kind of what we're getting into here with the disciples. Earlier in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sent out the disciples two by two, sent them out in groups by two to go out and to preach this message of repentance. And he gave them the authority and the ability to cast out demons. And so the disciples have gone out two by two with basically nothing. I mean, the Bible says that Jesus told them, basically just take the shoes on your feet, take a staff in your hand, don't take any money with you, no bags or anything. Just go out and proclaim this message of repentance. And so they've gone out for the first time on their own, being sent out by Jesus. And when they get to verse 30, the disciples are coming back to tell Jesus all that they had done. So let's pick it up in verse 30 and see what the text says. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus and they told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and were going and they had no, even, no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. They went off by themselves. I love last week how our pastor preached on rest. Right? If you missed last week, this is a great thing about the day and age we live. Right? If you missed one Sunday, you can go back and watch it on YouTube. And I'd encourage you to go watch his sermon from last week because rest is so important, isn't it? Physical rest and spiritual rest is so unbelievably important. And, and I'm not going to re-preach what he preached last week, but I love that Jesus models that for us here. I mean, the disciples get back from ministry. They get back and surely they're tired. They're exhausted. They've just invested a lot into the surrounding areas and they're coming back telling Jesus all that they have done. And Jesus says, that's great. Now on the hind side of this, we need to get away. Let's get in a boat. Let's go off to a desolate place and just rest. Let's get away and go rest. You know, um, I told our high school students this a couple weeks ago because in Mark chapter one, Jesus has already modeled this for his disciples. In Mark chapter one, you have a moment where Jesus is doing miracles. He's healing a bunch of people, doing a bunch of awesome things. And the Bible says on the next morning, he got up early. He went off to a desolate place and he rested. And here he's doing the same thing with his disciples. I, I told our high school students, you know, sometimes it's really good to get off the grid, isn't it? You say, Justin, what do you mean? Um, it's really good to silence your cell phone for just an hour sometimes. Okay? It, it's really good to just get off Facebook for 24 hours every now and then. Um, I promise you the craziness that you leave today will be waiting on you tomorrow. Okay? Um, I, I promise you. that I love that Jesus says to you, guys, it's okay for a second that we need to go off to a desolate place. We, we need to get away. We need to get off the grid for a little bit and simply rest. But how many of you know that sometimes we can make plans and things don't always work out according to plan, right? Uh, you ever been about to go on vacation and you're so excited to go and you can't wait and then right before you leave, something happens in your family and you're like, oh, this is going to be a drama-filled week, right? Or, or something happens at your job and you were so excited to leave it behind for the week, but now you just can't help but think about what you have to go back to, right? Th things don't always go according to plan sometimes. And I love it because Jesus has the plan and the intention to get away and rest with his disciples. But look at what happens in verse 33. It says, now many, many people saw them and they recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and they got ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I tell you, I always encourage our high school students on Wednesday. I said, it's okay to read the Bible with some imagination, right? And now I'm not saying to, to read in an imaginative way that you're reading things into it that's not there. That's not what I'm saying. But th this is a real event that's happening, isn't it? Isn't it? Right? It's a real event that's happening. And so it's okay to, to read this and maybe in our minds kind of think about, okay, what would this have looked like? Because I would argue that this picture kind of looks hilarious, what's happening right here. I mean, you got to imagine Jesus, as we see in the Gospel of Mark, he's pretty popular at this point. I mean, if you were touching lepers and healing blind people and casting out demons, you'd be pretty popular too, right? And uh, Jesus is pretty popular, and he's just sent his disciples out to do a lot of amazing, awesome things as well. So now the whole crew is popular. 
Everyone knows who they are. Everyone knows what these guys are doing. And so you got to imagine that Jesus, when he said, let's get in a boat and let's go over to a desolate place, they kind of had to sneak away, right? Because people would have definitely been watching them. But someone sees them and many people begin to see them kind of drift away and word begins to spread like absolute wildfire. Jesus is on the move and we got to get to where he's going. And I love what the Bible says. Did you catch it? where it says that they ran on foot from all the towns. Just imagine that scene for a second. Imagine we're up at uh, the corner right here at Chick-fil-A 74, and all of a sudden you look, and you got people running on foot from Charlotte. You got people running on foot from Mint Hill, from Monroe, from Waxhaw. You got people running on foot from everywhere. And, And let me remind you, this is not just a small number of people. We're gonna see in the text in a few minutes that there's about 5,000 men here at this event. And most people conservatively say if there was just 5,000 men, you can pretty safely assume that there was probably at least double that for women. So there's probably 10,000 people here. And on top of that, you can probably safely assume that there's probably two kids, if not more, for every man and child. So it's safe to assume that there's about 20,000 plus people on foot storming to try to find Jesus. Kind of a crazy picture that's happening, right? And I got to be honest with you. Um, If I'm the disciples here in this moment, and I'm getting away to rest with Jesus. Vacation with Jesus would be pretty fun, right? Like if I'm getting away to rest with Jesus and we're going to go off to a desolate place and we're rowing the boat and we come to where we can see the shore and I see thousands of people waiting for me, I'm getting a little frustrated. How many of you ever wake up and you're like, dude, I just can't deal with people today? <laughs> Some of y'all nodded y'all's head. We're in church, y'all be spiritual, be spiritual. But you know what I'm saying, right? We, there's moments when it's like, I just can't deal with people, and they were set on rest, right? They're they're set on getting away for a moment, and you got to imagine they're paddling this boat, and they see thousands on the shore. I'm like, Jesus, let's kick it in reverse, and let's just hang out on the lake for a little bit, right? But Because they're going for rest, but when they see thousands of people, rest is not what they're about to find. But can I give you a good thought this morning? It's good for me to think on this. Uh, Aren't you glad that Jesus is more compassionate than you and I? Because I think unanimously across this room, we would say, if I was going on vacation, even if it was a day, even if it was 24 hours or 36 hours just to stop and rest, if I saw a crowd full of people, I don't know how excited I would be, but Jesus is more compassionate than you and me. He's more loving than you and me. He's more graceful than you and I. The Bible says that he sees this crowd, and he doesn't just see them as a big number. He doesn't just see them as men and women and children and people from different social economic statuses and people with different degrees. He doesn't see them as that. What does the Bible say that he sees them as? He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. He looks on this crowd and sees them as sheep without a shepherd. Now I have a question for you. In him seeing them as sheep without a shepherd, why would that move Jesus to compassion? Why would seeing the sheep in that way In seeing the people as that way, a sheep without a shepherd, why would that drive him to compassion? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Um, Sheep without a shepherd die. Am I right? Uh, Sheep without a shepherd, death is imminent. Uh, We don't know if it'd be, you know, because they got lost on their own. Maybe it's because a predator came in and the sheep could not defend themselves. Maybe they ran out of food and didn't know where to go get food next. Any number of reasons could be the case for death. But a sheep without a shepherd is destined to die. Death is imminent. And Jesus sees these people. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd, and it says that he's moved with compassion. Can I I tell you how I was challenged by this? Um, I don't know about you, but I want to see people the way Jesus sees them. Right? I want to see people the way Jesus sees them. And If you and I see people as sheep without a shepherd, you and I can't help but be moved with compassion, can we? Listen to me. If you and I see them as sheep without a shepherd, you know what doesn't matter? Their their political preferences don't really matter anymore. Their their past, no matter how messed up their past is, it doesn't really matter anymore. You ever have people and you're scared to be around them because you know what they've been through in the past? That doesn't really matter anymore, does it? If if you see them as cheap without a shepherd, it doesn't really matter how sidetracked their future is. It doesn't really matter how crooked they are at work. It doesn't really matter how disruptive they are at family reunions. See, if, if you see someone as a sheep without a shepherd, every other issue takes second place. 
Every other issue you could have a bone to pick with them about or something takes second place because you realize all these other problems are just symptoms of the greatest problem that there's a shepherd that they have not met yet. I want to see people like Jesus. I pray that I would see them as sheep without a shepherd because you're moved with compassion. And I love this. Jesus sees them and they're supposed to relax, they're supposed to rest, but Jesus just begins to teach them. A day that was supposed to be full of relaxation and resting is turned into a day of more ministry. But as the day prolongs, a problem begins to arise. As the day prolongs, a problem begins to arise. Look at what the Bible says in verse 35 and verse 36. It says, and when it grew late, and I love that because Jesus was teaching. That means Jesus preached for a while. So don't get mad at preachers when we preach a long time, right? Uh, Sorry, that's selfish there. (laughs) When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. And the hour is now late. Send them away to go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. What's the problem that comes up? They don't have enough food, right? Um, Ladies, I can't speak for you in the room, but men, I I think I can speak for all of us. If you're at a gathering or a party and there's no food, that's a problem, right? Uh, that's a problem. I mean, I, I need food, and I don't need just finger foods. I need food, right? Um, I don't know if there's anything more disappointing than walking into a party and you see, like, just like a veggie tray. I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> help me out. Help me out a little bit. I have no one in mind when I say that. No one in mind. Just saying. Um, that's a problem, though, right? Food is, is a big deal. And the disciples are looking at this. Remember, there's 20,000 plus people conservatively there. And they're looking and they're, they're looking at the people, they're counting it out, they're looking at their wallets, they're looking at the supply of food that they have and they come to the very quick logical conclusion of, we don't got enough food to feed these people. Uh, uh, Jesus, you need to just send these people away and let's not hate on them too much because that's a, that's a pretty you know, logical response, right? I mean, they came here to rest anyway. Jesus, you've done enough. You've impacted them enough. You've taught them all these things. Just send them away. We'll get the relaxation and the rest that we wanted. Just send them away into another town. But I love Jesus' response because Jesus' response is not to send them away. Look at what he says in verse 37. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. You know what I can't wait? I I used to wish that in heaven we were going to have like a movie theater where we could see all the amazing things of the Bible, like how it happened, right? Like the Red Sea being split open. How cool would it be just to like like actually watch that happen? Um, I think the older I get, the more I don't really want that as much. And I just can't wait to like ask the disciples or ask someone who was there. And I know we have the account of it in God's word, but just all the detail, give it all to me. I wanna know. Um, I can't wait to ask like Peter and James and John and the disciples like, dude, what was on your mind when you're surrounded by 20,000 plus people? You don't have any food and you're like, Jesus, let's just send them away. And Jesus looks at you and says, hey, how about this? You feed them. Like, like moms in the room, you ever planned a party and you found out more people were coming than you originally thought and you just hit panic button? Multiply that by like thousands. You gotta imagine disciples like, I bet there was like a nervous kind of laugh, like, Jesus, that's a, that's a good one, right? Uh, don't really know, like we're disciples, you aren't really paying us all that much. Like what, what are we supposed to do? And look at their response. Their response says, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them to eat? So this is crazy because most people say 200 denarii's worth was about seven to eight months wages in that time. So let me just ask you, before we pick on the disciples, are you ready to cut a check for seven months of your wages to feed people? You ready for that? I don't know if I am. <laughs> and that's where they are, right? They're like, Jesus, you're, you're giving us this problem. There's, there's no food. And the problem here is insurmountable. There's, there's too many people. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough money. J- Jesus, the logical solution is just you've done enough. Just send them on their way to eat their food. Now, and I got to imagine, um, we, we need to be careful real quick because I think if we're not careful sometimes when we read the scriptures, we blame the disciples and we blame Israel in the Old Testament for doing things that we do all the time, right? Like if we're not careful, we're so quick to be like, come on, Peter, like, like, remember in John chapter 6, Jesus says he is the bread of life. Remember that? Like, we can be so careful. If we're, if we're not careful, we could be so quick to say, you know what, Peter? You're standing next to the bread of life, man. Like, why don't you ask the bread of life to feed people? Why, why don't you ask him to do what he does? Because isn't it amazing in this passage? I don't know if I ever realized this until I was studying for it this morning. The disciples never asked Jesus to do anything about the problem. Do you notice that? It's not there. 
The, the only solution they provide is Jesus just send them away. They never ask him to do anything because here is their problem and here is what they are doing that I think we so often do if we're not careful. Is we try to solve insurmountable problems with human solutions. If we're not careful, th- things will come up in our life and, and we are so tactical in the way we think about it, right? And we're like, okay, how can I get around it here? How can I do this there? How can I solve the problem by human means? And that's exactly what they're doing, isn't it? I mean, they're looking at this crowd. They're standing next to the Son of God, standing next to the bread of life, but they never once consult him. They never once ask him because they're looking at this problem that has arised, and they're only thinking of it from a human perspective. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. And they're they're limited by their vision of only seeing this problem from a human lens. But, But aren't you grateful that sometimes Jesus will bust into your life when you don't even ask him to? Has he ever done that to you? When I got showed up to church on Sunday morning, I wasn't even asking God to show me something, and bam, he busted in my life, right? That's exactly what he does, because I love this. They're looking for human solutions. They're, they're saying, Jesus, there's, there's not enough here. Just send them on their way. But sometimes you and I have problems in our life, and a divine solution is the only thing that can help. A divine solution, a divine intervention from God is all that can get us through. And I love what Jesus does in verse 38. Look at this. It says, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. And he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate, all 20,000 ate, and were satisfied. And they took up the 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish, and those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. You know what I wonder sometimes? Can I propose something this morning? I wonder if sometimes we're too familiar with the Bible. Now, I don't, mean, I don't mean that we know it too well, right? Because I, I think we all would say, I'll get in the front of the line this morning and say, I want to know God's word better. Like if we ever get to a place where like, yeah, I know this word well enough, um, that's a scary place to be, right? So I'm not arguing that we know it too well, but what I am saying is sometimes we can get very familiar with it. Because we, let me ask you this, how many of y'all knew where this story was going? You knew that they were gonna get fed? Just show, show hands. Most of us in this room, right? I mean, this is VBS 101, right? This is, this is kindergarten at VBS. This is like Christianity, like this, is, this is it, right? But, but I tell you what I've been praying in my life as I read, especially we're going through Mark as a student ministry, and I know these stories so well. So I've just been praying, and I pray it again for this morning, is Lord, let us see this and feel this with fresh eyes just to remind us how stinking awesome this is. Because I'm just gonna be honest, I didn't, not, not hating on you. Nine o'clock didn't do it either, so don't feel worse. Like, I didn't hear anyone say amen when the thousands got fed. Maybe you whispered it. I, I didn't hear any of us rejoice. But, but we need to stop and think about this for a second because there was a problem here that man could not solve. There was a problem here that the disciples, the ones who are supposed to be the good followers of Jesus, are looking around and like, Jesus, we've seen you touch lepers, bro. We've seen you touch blind people. We've seen you done things for individuals. We've never seen you heal thousands and touch thousands. Just send them on their way. There was a problem here that human solutions could not fix, but the divine solution steps in. Jesus steps in. And did you notice that he doesn't need much? I mean, you think about five loaves and two fish. That could not feed half of this section right here. Couldn't feed half of this section. And Jesus says, that's all you got, Get, give it to me. Five loaves, two fish. He blesses it. And the Bible says that thousands were fed. I don't know how it happened. I mean, I, I kind of imagine the disciples get a basket and they're like, oh my gosh, that's more than five. Start handing them out, right? And as I get to what they think is the end, they look in and it's just still overflowing. Like, I, I don't know how it works. But, but all I know is that at the end of the miracle, everyone ate and were satisfied. No, no one's stomach was going grumbling after Jesus got done with them. They ate and they were filled. And the Bible says that they had enough for leftovers, 12 baskets for the disciples. Jesus stepped into a problem that man couldn't solve. And with just a little, he made it a lot. With just a little, he made it a lot. And here's the awesome thing, is is we could go home on that note right there, couldn't we? 
Because here's what I believe, is there's so many people in a room this size watching online. There is probably so many of you that have problems in your life and they seem insurmountable. The things in your life that you have analyzed from the left, you've analyzed it from the right, and you can come to no solution that works, but you needed to be reminded this morning that when Jesus steps in, all things are possible. That when Jesus steps in, even if you don't feel like you have a lot, he can turn that into plenty of enough to satisfy us, to fulfill us, and give us even leftovers. He's that good. He is that good. He's a good God. And now you might expect me to stop there because we just got to the end of the, the, the miracle, right? Like, you might expect me to stop there, um, but, but I can't because I don't think Mark wants us to. Okay, I don't think Mark wants us to. How many of y'all remember uh, beginning of the service, Psalm 23? You still have that in your mind? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Green grass, he leads me beside still waters. You still got that in your mind? Okay, all right. Let's look at what Mark does next. How many uh, detail people in the room? Detail people? All right, Mark's about to kill you, okay? Look at, look at what he says, verse 45. Immediately, immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Oh, and Mark, Jesus just fed thousands. Like, can you not give us a crowd reaction or something? Like, do you notice he doesn't include any of that? Like, literally, what does Mark say? So Jesus blessed the food. They started feeding people. They all ate and were satisfied. There were leftovers, 12 baskets full. And immediately, Jesus gets them in the boat and heads across the water. Like, there's no crowd reaction or nothing. It's clear Mark is rushing us on from the feeding of the thousand to get us into the boat with the disciples. So look at what he goes on to say. It says, and after Jesus, after he had taken leave of them, he went up on a mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. I, I would be remiss if I did not say here, that that verse right there puts a bullet into any idea that following Jesus guarantees you an easier life. I think sometimes if we're not careful, trials and troubles can come up in our life and we're like, oh my gosh, is God punishing me? Is God correcting me? And then sometimes he is. I mean, so sometimes he will do that in our life. But did you notice here, the disciples follow Jesus perfectly. The, the disciples are obedient to what Jesus says. He says, get in the boat, they get in the boat. He says, go across the other side, they go across the other side. And yet it still comes into a storm. Sometimes following Jesus will lead you right in the middle of a storm. Sometimes it will. And I'm grateful Jesus is on the land, they're on the boat, but he sees them. Did you notice that? I just want to encourage you, he sees you today. He sees you. I, I don't know what you're going through, but he sees you. And he sees his disciples and look at what he does. About the fourth watch of the night, really, really late, between 3 and 6 a.m., about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. <laughs> y'all, we're too familiar with the Bible. How many of y'all got a pool? A pool? How many of y'all live close to a pond? How many of y'all got a bathtub if you don't got any of those things? <laughs> Here you go, you ready? ready? Uh, I've got a bathtub filled up with water today. You got a pool, go out to it, a pond. I give you 10 tries. Try doing what Jesus did and you're going to get wet, right? I give you 10 tries. You can get a run and start. You can do whatever you need to do. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and bank on the fact you can't do it. You, you can't do it. And don't you love how Mark says it so casually? Did you notice that? It's like about the fourth watch of the night, he came to us just walking on water, doing, doing what he does. I love it. And it made a little more sense if the water was calm, but they're in the middle of a storm, right? I mean, this is treacherous water, but it doesn't matter. There, there's no situation in your life Jesus can't get to. There's nothing in your life that Jesus is too far from. He walks on water. So cool. Look at what it says. It says, he meant to pass them by. But when he saw him, when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and they cried out for they all saw him and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart. It is I, don't be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. His presence changes things. His presence changes things. And look at how this concludes. It says, and they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. You say, Justin, why, why did you combine these two stories? Like it would make much more sense to, to preach on the loaves or preach on Jesus walking on water. Why'd you combine these two? Well, 
I think that last verse lets us know that Mark did. Did you catch that? I mean, it's right there in the passage, right? What's the last verse say? It says, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves. They didn't understand about what happened on the shore. And because they didn't understand about the loaves, their hearts were hardened, and they didn't really get what was happening on the water either. Do you see how Mark combines those two things? Can I tell you the most frustrating part of reading the gospel of Mark? The most frustrating part I've experienced as I'm just kind of working through this on my own time with the Lord is that Jesus does miracle after miracle. I mean, he's casting out demons. He's touching lepers. He's healing blind people. He's stopping women's bleeding issues. He's walking on water. He's feeding thousands. He is doing all these amazing things. And can I tell you the most frustrating thing is that no one, no one can come to the correct conclusion of who Jesus actually is. You're like, Justin, what do you mean? If you read Mark's gospel, this is not the first time that Jesus does something awesome and the disciples leave and they're just amazed. And they're like, they're, in Mark chapter four, when Jesus calms the storm earlier, Jesus calms the storm and the storm ceases and the disciples are literally like, who is this that even winds and seas obey him? If you were, go to Mark chapter eight, Jesus asked his disciples, he says, who are people saying that I am? And the word had spread about Jesus. They were saying that he was John the Baptist reborn. They're saying that he's Elijah reborn. They're saying that he's just some other great prophet. Jesus is doing these amazing things, and yet no one can come to the correct conclusion of who Jesus actually is. Isn't it crazy that you and I can be so close to Jesus and still might not get who he is? So, Justin, what do you mean by that? Is there are people all in churches all across America that are there every single week and still don't know him as Savior and Lord. That you be so close and not understand who he is and what he came to do. But I love it because no one can make the correct conclusion. They're all like the disciples here in Mark chapter 6. They're blown away and they're astounded, but they can't make the connection until Mark chapter 15. In Mark chapter 15, there's a moment where, where someone finally gets it. He, he finally makes the correct conclusion on who Jesus is. And I love it because it's the least likely person you would ever expect. It's not a disciple. It's not uh, someone that Jesus healed. It's not anybody like that. You know who it is? It is a Roman centurion. It's a Roman centurion in Mark chapter 15. And here's what I love. He does not come to the conclusion after Jesus heals someone. He doesn't come to that conclusion after Jesus cast out a demon. He doesn't come to that conclusion after Jesus walks on water or feeds thousands. But it's when the Roman centurion looks at the cross, he sees Jesus dying for sins that he did not commit. And, and for sins that he did not commit, that means he was dying for your sins and mine. Covered in shame that he was undeserving of. When he looks on the cross and sees Jesus, it's in Mark 15, 39, that that Roman centurion, the least likely person, declares, truly this man was the son of God. Truly this man, the one who died for people who didn't deserve it. The, the one who did not sin but became sin for you and I. The, the one who took everything you've ever done and nailed it to a cross. It was when he saw Jesus on the cross, he said, truly this man was the son of God. See, for you and I, the cross and the empty tomb brings into clarity who Jesus is. Brings into clarity who Jesus is. Here's what I'm saying. Jesus is not just a good teacher. Je Jesus is not just a great miracle worker. Jesus is not just a great moral example. Is he all over those things? Yes, he is. But he is most importantly the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He most importantly is the Son of God. God in the flesh to die for your sins and mine. And it's on the cross that the first person in the Gospel of Mark says, I get it. I get who he is. He is the Son of God. You say, Justin, how in the world does this tie into Mark chapter 6? Well, let me ask you, as, as Mark is writing this, and fun fact for you, uh, most people unanimously expect, accept and agree on that Mark is writing this, but really this is Peter's account of Jesus' life, that Peter is helping Mark write this gospel. And so you're really reading Peter's words through Mark's hand. Let me ask you this, when they're writing this, is this before the resurrection or after the resurrection? Let me ask you. It's, it's after, right? It's, it's after. That's not a trick question. It's after. Jesus has died. He's rose again. He's ascended. The church is moving. The church is growing. And they begin to write this gospel to, to record all the things that Jesus did. So after 
crucifixion, and after resurrection, guess what? It is clear to them now we understand who Jesus is. We understand who Jesus is. We saw him crucified. We saw him buried. We saw him risen. There is no doubt in our mind who Jesus is. He has been brought into clarity. And I say all that to say this. I don't think they understood it in time in Mark chapter 6 because the Bible says they were confused and astounded, doesn't it? But here's what I think. Looking back on it, you know what I think Peter began to realize? I was confused then. But I get it now. Mark chapter 6 is the good shepherd in action. It's the good shepherd in action. Can I prove it to you and can I show you? What what does Psalm 23 say? It says, the Lord is my what? Did you see how Jesus saw the people in verse 34? He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. That's the first time in Mark's gospel you see that language. He sees them a sheep without a shepherd. What does Psalm 23 say? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Do you see what verse 39 said? Oh, this is so good. What does it say? Jesus commands them, hey, sit down on green grass. Listen to me. Why didn't Mark just say grass? Why, why didn't Mark just say he made us sit down? Why, why didn't Mark just say he made us sit down on the ground? No, no, Peter's telling Mark, I want you to tell him it was green grass. Jesus said, y'all freaking out about this problem. Sit down in the lush green grass and just chill out while I do what I do. Did you notice what did we talk about last week, Psalm 23? He makes us lie down. Did you see Jesus didn't suggest getting on green grass? He commands them to sit on green grass. He says, hey, green grass, sit. (laughs) He commands them. What What is the Bible say about the people? They ate, thousands ate, an insurmountable people. They ate, and what did the Bible say? They ate, and they were fulfilled, and they were satisfied. What does the Bible say in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you and I meet the good shepherd, we have all that we need. Maybe my favorite part, it gets better. What happens next? Jesus leads his disciples onto the sea. Storm comes raging. They think that Jesus is not with them. Jesus is on the sea, on the shore. They're in the sea, but what does Psalm 23 say? It says, the Lord leads me beside still waters. That even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I got to imagine Peter's telling Mark, and he's looking back and saying, man, I didn't get it then. But that was the good shepherd in action. When, when I was freaking out about how to solve the problems, he made me sit down on green grass. When, when I was hungry, And all of us were hungry. He fed us. We were satisfied. There were leftovers. And then I got on the boat and the storm was raging. It was crazy. And I thought we might die. I didn't think Jesus was going to show up. But yet he was with me in the storm and he led us home on still waters. It was the good shepherd in action. Can I tell you what I challenge you today is that the good shepherd is still acting. So, Justin, how do you say that? Well, I I would have no confidence to say that if the tomb was occupied, but the tomb's empty. He is alive. He is well. The good shepherd is still in action today. And I'm a little biased, but I love this sermon because I think the same question applies for all of us in this room. It applies for every single person in this room, and that question is this. So will you trust the good shepherd? If you're here today and you've never once placed your faith and trust in Christ, you've never begun to follow him, you have, maybe you fooled yourself into thinking that you're the shepherd of your own life, but you are being led by something. Whether that's financial gain, whether that's earthly peace or whatever, you're being led by something and today you realize, I need to be led by Jesus. Gotta tell you what, he's not just the shepherd, he's the good shepherd. Say, why why does that matter? Because Jesus says in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is not a bad shepherd for you. He's a good one because he gives his life for you and he gave it for you on the cross. Maybe today you need to follow and trust in him for the first time. But I think the question is true too for every single believer in this room. Will you trust the good shepherd? I don't know about you. I needed to be reminded to trust him all the time. Because it seems so often that problems arise that are insurmountable. It seems far too often, sometimes more than we'd like, that problems rise up and there's no human solution. There's no human response that makes sense. And I just need to be reminded that the good shepherd is still in action to trust him. Maybe some of you are in the greatest storm of your life and you feel like Jesus is not with you. His word says he never leave you nor forsake you. His word says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. 
And you need to say, well, Lord, I trust you today. I trust you. Will you trust the good shepherd? He's really good. He's really good. So will you trust him today? Would you pray with me as we close? Man, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you in that song as we sang earlier. It says, you don't speak in vain. No syllable is empty or void. Lord, we believe that about your word. So, Lord, we're confident this morning that your word will not return void. And I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that we were encouraged and we were challenged, Lord. Lord, that we were reminded that you are the good shepherd. You're the good shepherd who satisfies our soul. Who makes us lie down in green pastures. Who, even though life can get crazy sometimes, you lead us by still waters. You're with us even in our darkest night. We thank you that you're the good shepherd. We praise you, Lord, for that. Would I pray if there's someone here today that does not know you, they've never begun to place their faith and trust in you and never turned from their sin, never followed you at all, would I pray that today would be the day whether they realize they're being shepherded by other things in their life and they need to surrender to you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bother them in this moment. Draw them unto yourself. Would I pray they would respond and and come down front where I can show them what that next step looks like and, and show them what that looks like to follow you. Would I pray for someone today if that's them? And Would I just pray for every believer in the room? Lord, I don't know about everyone else, but I know for me, I need to be reminded so often that I can trust you because you are the good shepherd in my life. Lord, you, you've met my needs so many times. You have been with me through so many dark nights. Lord, uh, help me to continue to trust you. Lord, we, we see the totality of who you are in the gospels. We see that you're the good shepherd who lays down your life for us. And so, Lord, if you laid down your life for us, let us trust you daily with ours. Lord, I pray that every believer in this room would be challenged and encouraged this morning Lord, that they can trust you. They can trust you because you're the good shepherd. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this morning to worship you together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.